All right, special guest today, Victor from Worldwide, one of the owners there. He's coming here today to help us understand the top 10 parasites, uh, coral parasites specifically, and how to deal with them. Yeah, hey, how are you guys? How yeah. are you, Ryan? So, um, yeah, uh, a lot of people, when they got a reef tank, they're constantly dealing with a lot of issues, a lot of parasites, a lot of unwanted, unwanted hitchhikers, and I figure why not talk about them, how to deal with the top 10 worst parasites in the hobby. There we go, start with number one. A Monty eating nudibranch. And before we say how to deal with it, what is it? So it's a little animal, it's a nudibranch. It's known for devouring Monty porous. That's all they eat, that specific one. And we name it number one. It is the worst parasite to get rid of in the aquarium hobby. It is hands down the worst. Uh, so one of the things that you wanna do to get rid of them, you wanna, let's say you got a big Monty pora cap. You see how they swell over each other. There's a lot of room for hiding for the parasite. So since this is the worst parasite to get rid of, what you want to do is you have to cut a big frag. Unfortunately, you do not want to hear this. You have to get rid of the rest. Either give it to somebody who wants to deal with the headache or toss it away. It's not what we want to hear. But then you put a frag. You put a frag in a different tank. So when you say make a frag, like if I had a big cap, what should the frag look like when I'm done? Um, it should be maybe nice and flat, the flatter the possible so where you can look under it to see if there's any eggs or if you can see any of the, any of the animals left in there. So one of the things that you're going to do, you're going to, for the next month or so, you're going to dip the coral Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. You're going to observe. You're going to put them in a white container. You're going to use a turkey baster. You're going to blow on the coral and just make sure that nothing's coming out. If you can go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for four weeks, then what you're going to do for the next two months, you're only going to do it once a month. If during those two months you find any parasites, you go back to step one, which is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It is very difficult to get rid of this this um, hitchhiker, which is the Montiporate and Nudie brings. Um, so when you say dip, what kind of dip are you using? Uh, we like to use a Lugo Solution Iodine. Mm -hmm. uh, Coral RX works pretty well. There's many different ones. There's one from Julian Coral Revive. But the one that we seem that it seems to work well for them is the Iodine dip. You know, it's funny because this uh, you're gonna we're gonna get to the uh, uh, Zoa eating neuterbrons gotcha. here in a minute, but I it sounds very similar to what I had to do with those, and they're a similar creature. They just eat something different. Yeah, they they seem to be like the same. They just have a different diet, but we're gonna get to those. Those are a lot easier to get rid of. This the the reason for the monties, they just if you think of a monty porous and encrusted on plate and coral, they can find too much room for hiding. When you get a colony of zoanthids, they just spread around the rock and there's no room for them to hide between, other than in between the polyps. Mm -hmm. So if there's a rats, the rats can go from the top, just peeking in between. Where there's a montipore, if it's swirling everywhere, the rats can not get in there. Mm -hmm. So so we have Monty eating nudibranchs in the 160, right? Okay. And our primary solution is actually just to manage the fact that they're in there. And uh, even though the six line rats was a big pain in the ass for a bunch of other reasons, uh, it was really good at eating them. It kept them at bay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say, though, like, that tank uh, over the years has picked up a variety of pests. Uh, but, like, I mean, I, it's just going to be an interesting uh, journey for a lot of people because a lot of people want to eradicate the whole thing. And what you just described is basically it. You're going to reduce the colony down to a frag. Yes. Purpose is to get rid of all of them that are living on the edge and eating it. Yeah, all and, the hiding area. Yep, all the hiding areas in it. Uh, get rid of hopefully the places where maybe some eggs would be too. Yes. You're gonna dip it to get the adults off before they get to the age that they can actually reproduce. Exactly. And that's the purpose of dipping Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, uh, so you don't let them reproduce. They don't get to the point where the eggs actually get to hatch. So the eggs hatch, they start eating, and then you dip yes. them and get them off, right? Yeah. So another thing that we do too, Ryan, on the Montiporus, on the crusting Montiporus. So let's say you have a, a rainbow encrusted Montipora. We cut a frag, let's say two inches across, and we make an epoxy big enough where we almost like bond it in there. So it seals all, there's no way. So if there was uh. any eggs or any nudies, they're dead. They're just sealed in there. Uh. So now think about it, like in order, so now those are the easiest ones when you got an encrusted Monty, you seal the bottom and you create this little dome and now you're blowing and you can see everything. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to get underneath. Okay, so like, if I had something like that, could I then hey, take the little frag of it, uh, build it down, and like you said, nobody wants to do that, but also you'd like to get rid of these things. Yes. Uh, get it down to that size, and then 
maybe even push it down that it goes over the live tissue just a little bit. And yes, with that, that's, that's what you basically do. You're silly. You're completely silly where it's going to be epoxy and live coral, basically. You know, it's funny because like, that's the approach that I ended up taking with Aptasia a lot. <laughs> it, is uh, like instead of you know trying to kill it with Aptasia X uh, and all this other stuff, it was always like, let's just get some epoxy or super glue or whatever and just like kind of coax it into its hole and then Boom. seal it in there, right? But aptasias are crazy because I have seen them where you seal them on one side and they come out from the they other find side. find a way. Oh my they gosh, those things are like, they're in our list as well, guys. So. They are on here too. So yeah, that takes care of multiporating nudies. Uh, follow those steps and it should work. So I'll just throw in here, if uh, all that stuff you're not willing to do and you're just going to decide to live with these things in your tank, which is an option, yes. uh, what would be the best ways to, you know, fight the fact that they're already in there? Uh, you got to be constantly be blowing on, on the Monty Pores with the turkey baster and introduce a lot of rasses in your tank. So they're good. you have to teach them how to eat them. Uh, if you blow this, this, um, this pest out of the uh, Monty Pora, eventually the, the rasses, they come around and they realize that it's food. Mm -hmm. And once they learn it's food, they actually, they see you go in there with the turkey baster and they're going to start sw swimming around the Monty Pora, just waiting for you to feed them some live food, you know? So the way that this goes for us is it ebbs and flows. You're, you nailed it, man. You blow them off and then like the rasses and things figure out that they're foods and as soon as they go into the water, yeah, they, they go more. crazy for the life. Okay, well now all the adults are not there munching on your coral anymore. And so if you did that, if you got some rasses in there and uh, like specifically like your halichorus rash, your chorus rash, your six nine rash, mm -hmm. you're calling them uh, actually what did you call them? Long nose rats. Long nose rats. Yeah, yeah, the green chorus, yellow chorus, red chorus, A line rats, all of those. Things that just like look like they're hunting and pecking all day. This is exactly what they're doing. And one thing to note here is the reason that you have these money, Nudibronx, is because they are in the ocean. Yes. You know, they exist in the ocean. Uh, and the reason that they haven't overwhelmed the ocean uh, is because there are six line rats in there and there's waves and stuff blowing them off. Yes. You know? So it can, you can do the same thing in your tank. Now, I think we'd all prefer they just weren't in there at all. And while yeah. you're talking about eradication, but in some cases, you're just going to live with them. And maybe you don't want to take your whole tank apart. Yeah, so I've seen people that live with them. And what they do is they, they bring a big Monty and they make it smaller. They don't get rid of it. So at least you have access to try to blow, like we're saying with the turkey bait, and give, give access to the fish. So try to get them as small as possible so there's less room for the animal to hide and there's less room for them to eat. Now, the caveat to the management component of this is that you get lazy. And so the tank starts to look good. You got the rasses. You think they're doing a great job. You think it's over. You stop flushing. And then six months later, all of a sudden, you start seeing the tissue eat. Yeah. You lose a little bit of the color and all this stuff. And that's because you stop flushing. You have to. This is now part of your life. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be flushing these things on the weekends, trying to make sure to get them off. It's just part of what you're going to do. Now, for me, if I was going to give counsel to somebody, it would be if I had just put some uh, some money in, in there and I found out that I got nudies or, or even, you know, the frags were like, you know, getting a little bit bigger, I'd treat them. I'd take them out and I'd treat them. Yeah. If I had a full blown tank and mature colonies and stuff in here, and then I put the wrong frag in there and introduced them. I don't think I have the heart to tear down a, like a basically existing display. And I'd probably start to, to deal people. with them. So uh, pick your path. All right. Next one here is acro eating flatworms. This was like when I started the hobby, anybody who got these was like they called it like a death sentence and you had to like almost start over. So uh, what are you going to do with acro eating flatworms? So a lot of people. Oh, or wait, wait. What do they look like first? Uh, they look like uh, brown little things. They're clear. They're very hard to spot in the actual uh, coral. What you do realize, you start seeing little white dots in the acroporas, especially like velitas, tricolors. You see them on them usually, and then you see the coral doesn't have color anymore. Then you look on the base and you see these golden little dots. Those are eggs. Mm -hmm. um, the bite marks is what people see a lot too. Yeah, those are the little white dots. Those are oh. the bite marks. Okay. So a lot of people think that acropora eating flowers is the worst parasite that you can get on your aquarium. And like I said earlier, it is not. It is the second worst. We, based on experience, we've been doing this for well over 15 years commercially, and we can get rid of acroporating flowers faster than we can get rid of uh, multiporating nudies. Multiporating nudies, they will just linger. When you think you beat them, there's one guy on hiding 
who's under the mud for six months, breathing through a straw, and he comes out, and he's like, ah, you thought, yeah, I mean, you don't. Acroporting flowers, they seem to be a little easier based on the fact that, obviously, if you got giant acropores, like you're doing some of these things back there, then you're in trouble. But they are just easy to spot. You can go in there and you can blow on the coral and then they're going to go flying. Now, Montipora, they don't, most of the time, at least it's a horrible infectation, they're on the bottom of the coral, not on top. So how are you going to go with a turkey baster and blow? With an acropora, you can do that. Mm -hmm. So same thing, very similar to the uh, Montiporas. Lots of blowing with the turkey baster, having tons of rashes. And we do similar dipping method that we do with the Montipora. I iodine? Uh, yes, iodine too. Uh, but like I said, it's just it seems to be easier. For some reason, once you learn how to recognize where the parasite is and where you recognize what the eggs look like, you go to the same thing. You go one month, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. If you go the four weeks, all 12 dips with no, you didn't find any flowers, then you move to once a week for the next two months. If, let's say, on week three that you're doing Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, you find the parasite again, you start again from zero. <laughs> there's no that guys i'm sorry there's no easy way but what i learned is once you recognize what these parasites look like you can fight them and as long as you understand the concept to have less food for them which is the coral being smaller less hiding surface so do the do the acri and flapworms have a time of day do they like prefer nighttime or uh like uh, when the lights are on or are they just eating all day long i think all day long i never like that's a good question ryan i never really Pay attention to it, but it seems to me like once the infestation is there. So uh, again, we'll get to those zoanthid nudies. But when I was dealing with those, I was instructed to dip them at night because that's when they like to come out and munch on the corals. And during the day, they might have actually left the coral and be hiding somewhere else. I could see that how that could happen, because if you think about it, the fish go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. They go to the little hiding spot, you know, the rats, they build a little cocoon at night. So they animals adapt and they know so they know hey my parasite is not here so let me come out and eat at night so i can see that how that could happen i never really taken the time but now you got me thinking so when i get back if i ever find some other parasites i'm gonna run a little test on it we learn and adapt every day yeah uh, you do one of the things that we've used here and i know a lot of the community uses on uh, flatworms if you're going to choose to just live with them because Again, there's some tanks like the BRS 160, man. I wasn't just going to devastate it as soon as we found them in there. Like, I and then you realize you live with them. Yeah, you're going to live with them. So same thing that you're talking about is pumping them off with uh, the baster. But it is easier because you can get yeah. to the base is really easy. You can recognize the signs of it because the little munching marks and stuff on yeah. it. Six line wrasses and stuff like that. And all the chorus wrasses of the world. They love that stuff. Uh, but also, uh, there's some debate as to how it works. But the coral and zooked flatworm stop, and I think they combine it with this coral booster stuff. Uh, we've you tried had, it. You we've, tried it. We've had good success with it here. I know Jen, uh, who uh, owns a local store here okay. and, and uh, has been in many of our videos. She uses this stuff for all her clients too. Uh, and what it's believed to do is to make the tissue unpalatable. So when they bite into it, they just don't like it. Right. They, they just starve themselves. Yeah, like and I, I don't know. What they've also found is that and it might be just like the, it could be like, I mean, I don't want to say flavor, but it could be like a bitterness. It could be like that the it has an extra thick slime coat. It could be a variety of things. Nobody's really identified exactly what it is other than there's an overwhelming amount of people that are saying that this works, right? Yeah, that, that product's been around for a long time, but it kind of hit the surface about four or five years ago here in the United States. You know, it hits like a, like a, like they call it like the the early adopters and then after the early adopters hit it then all of a sudden like the next wave of people are using that i think we're in that it's like it is a highly effective tool but people have also found that it just actually makes the corals even the healthy ones look better sure. so uh, interesting uh results out, one, out of that one thing i noticed with acropora too they're a lot easier to live with acropora eating flower for some reason it seems to get a horrible infestation it takes a lot more than to get a horrible infestation of the multiple eating notice I think it has to do with the do the fact that they can hide. And one more thing I want to mention mm. before we move to the next one. When dipping acroporas, I highly, highly suggest if you're doing Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, maybe the first dip when you know the parasites are there, attack it with um, iodine or other product. But mainly I like to do my dips, just water and a turkey baster. Just water. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't put stress to the core. 
Uh, when you blow the coral, if you blow in the right angle, the, the worm you're going to see, it, it's going to come off. Then you're, so basically you're inspecting the coral to remove them physically and you're looking for eggs. If you do find eggs, you have to scrape them or you have to seal them with super glue over them. And that's basically it. I just wanted to bring that up before we move on. Okay, so answer. that's actually, I was going to try to, I, I had said iodine in here, but like, uh, uh, you know, you're saying like whatever dip. So the iodine dip or the... You yeah, know. Revive or Coral Rex. All of these dips, they work. I mean, they've been around for a long time. I just, me personally, feel like the coral's already stressed enough by you moving them out of its environment. Mm -hmm. You're dipping them three times a week. The and acros lose their color. Yeah. Like, well, they lose their color when you dip them. There's just yeah, no and they're stressed. So what I learned is if you move them just to give them in a, from one container to the other, you blow them gently, the coral does not feel any medicine, does not get stressed out, and it has worked well for us. So I highly recommend that. Hmm, interesting. Now, if it's bad with flowers, then I recommend put medicine. But if you're looking for them and you don't find anything, don't put the coral under more stress. It's not needed. All right, next one. Uh, this one plagued me for a little while. The uh, zoanthid eating nudibrachs look very similar to uh, the Monty ones. Uh, and they actually even look similar to like a coral or a zoanthid polyp to yeah, some degree. Yeah, so this is what happened. When, um, when the zoanthid and nudibranchs, they eat the zoanthids, they steal the coral, the pigmentation, they get it into them and you see them in the little spikes. Mm -hmm. So if you ever come at night, you ever seen them? I remember the first time I found one. This is many, 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 many years ago. And I remember putting a flashlight at night to and I'm like, wow, look at this, it's so cool. And then you realize they're eating the color of your zoanthids. Um, again, very similar to uh, the uh, Montiporating nudibranchs. They're a lot easier. The fact why they're easy, if you guys hear me talking about the Montis, they have a lot of room for hiding. With zoanthids, they don't. Most zoanthids, they reach half of an inch when they're fully open to the top. So they can only hide in between the polyps. There's no many hiding spots. So if you have enough predators, they should be able to handle the the... The parasite itself. The, the yellow chorus rash for me <laughs> was unbelievably effective. Yes. The yep. green one is the most aggressive one. That mm. is just like over I the just, top. I, I don't have these things, but I just, uh, there's a green one sitting at the 360 right now waiting to be uh, put in today, uh, actually. So, oh, he's uh, going to have a field day. Yeah, I don't have any uh, of the uh, nudies. nudies or zoanthids, to be frank. But I, I just like how that fish swims around, pecks off past all yeah. the time. So one thing we've done with zoanthids before, we dipped them in fresh water. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend it too much. Just do it fast. I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. Blow as fast as you can. And those things, they literally, they touch the, the nudibranchs for zoanthids. They touch fresh water and they disintegrate. They disappear. Pay attention to these guys. Do not, whatever you do, do never, never, never dip a montipor in fresh water. It literally takes five seconds for the coral to be dead. There's something about it. Acroporas, you can for five, ten seconds. I do not recommend that. But Montiporas, the minute they touch fresh water, they're done. So I was going to say that when I did my own dips on the zoanthids, I did it in iodine freshwater dip. Uh, and it absolutely worked the way that you're talking about, yes. which is I dipped them every few days. Uh, every few days I dip it in there and then the eggs that had hatched would turn into little juveniles. The juveniles would fall off and I did the dip, I'd put it back in. Uh, and then after doing that for a few weeks, you have essentially eradicated all of them from the tank. Uh, and then just for good measure, I'd throw those yellow chorus rats. Yeah, out. and then that's it, you've never seen them again. Yeah, never seen them again. Uh, now, the one thing about like uh, Monty's and acroeating flatworms is, unless it, was, unless it was like a really bad situation, when I got the frag, I wouldn't be able to tell that it was on there. Like, uh, I wouldn't be able to like visually inspect it and see that this you know, frag has acroeating flatworms because usually it's not like, like there's not covered in eggs and like adults all over it or whatever. Zoanthids though. If you get a zoanthid, especially a wild colony one, if you, you get sit on top of it, yeah. I mean, you, if you well, first off, if you dip it, they're gonna fall off in there for them. sure, and you're gonna see these cool little critters going moving. around. Yeah, you'll see, you'll see them. They look like the coolest little slug you ever seen. Uh, but also, you can see the eggs if you just look really careful and like go Google this. The and, spirals. Yeah, there's a little spiral and they right on the edge of the like polyp whitish, head. like whitish, clear type of thing. Yeah, yeah so if you kind of swish them, get them to close up and then look at them, you will actually be able to see the egg. Yes. And so in this case, 
if you come across one with the egg sack on it or uh, an adult falls off when you're doing your dip, don't put that in your tank. You no. know, do what we're talking about because it's super easy now. Just put it in any old bucket of water that's heated uh, and I like light almost isn't even the most important no. thing here. And then just do that dip for like a couple of weeks every three days and then put it in the tank. You'll probably be fine. Yes. Yeah. Like, so this is, this is a really easy one to avoid uh, cause you can see it visually. All right. Next one, <sighs> the dreaded Aptasia. Uh, how do you get this out of your tank? All right. There's many, many different ways of doing it. Um, a lot of people use Aptasia S, Aptasia Killer. I'm sure there's a million different products. Mm -hmm. I'm not a believer I'm shooting them. I just feel like you use oppress them and then they come right back. I, I like, I don't know if it's true. People say that they're like, when they're dying, they spread or something. You know, like, uh, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but it feels true. <laughs> it, it, it seems to me like the, in order for Aptasia to spread, the nitros need to be pretty high and you have to feed a lot of particle foods. So particulate foods, if you feed a lot of particulate foods, man, these things explode. They explode. I mean, yeah. I've seen people live with one or two Aptasias and you see the Aptasia there and it's in the tank, but they don't, they're not popping babies. And I've seen them when 2,000 babies are popping each day. But uh, anyhow, some of the best techniques to get rid of them is, uh, so there's a few of them. Um, well, when we talk about Aptasias, we're talking about also Mahanos. Mm -hmm. uh, Mahanos are very hard to get rid of. Mahanos look like little baby anemones, like tiny, they're like a green base with like a little brown tentacles. Mm -hmm. Those things you have to get rid of with the Aptasia eating foul fish. Okay. But the problem with that is you cannot keep it on a reef. So those basically they have to be remo removed manually if they're on your reef. So I've had mixed results with the file fish. Right? Okay. So I've had them be reef safe in many, many cases. Oh, wow. Right. I'm impressed. Uh, and then one day they're not. Luckily, they're not the prettiest looking fish. Uh, so the day that they're not, they're also not the hardest thing to catch either because they're <laughs> kind of, they're not like great swimmers. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, it isn't like the biggest risk to try because it's not that hard to remove. I mean, as far as removing a fish, this is amongst the easier ones. Yeah, that, that one is easy, but again, it can turn pretty diverse. It depends on what size. If you put them in the tank, it might not be as easy to catch. So much coral for him to hide. Mm -hmm. But then I saw earlier when I just got here, you had some bags with copperman butterflies. Mm -hmm. uh, that is our number one option. They're reef safe most of the time. I've seen them where after a year or two, they might turn into some of your LPS and start picking up, then you have to remove and put a new one. But they're known for eating Aptasias all day long. Peppermint shrimps are really good. Uh, just make sure that if you don't have Aptasia, you're constantly feeding because they, they like to eat the tritos on the floor, all the unwanted foods. If you don't feed, then they're gonna get a little pesky and they're gonna start picking at your LPS. Or die. Or die, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Aptasia hours, no matter what you do, it seems like we're gonna end up introducing into our tank because they're almost in, invisible when you introduce them in your tank it can be a little especially if you're into lps uh, i mean you could probably get a you could probably set up a sps tank without introducing aptasia yeah you, if, especially if, if you do a little... frags yeah frags direct from someone's tank yeah if you get a plug from someone that can be hiding on the plug so well especially because the way with sps a lot of times what you'll do is cut the plug off and not take any, uh, uh, even including a little bit of living tissue. Yeah, so you're, you're literally uh, taking the coral only. Yeah, the chances of you getting pests there go way, 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 way down at that yes. point, especially something like Aptasia, almost impossible now. Yes. Uh, but if you're putting, like, branching your philia in there and uh, brains and stuff that's got all this kind of, like, rock substance to it, there's just no way. Man. Yeah. It's, you're probably going to introduce this at some point in time. Aptasia. Yeah. I, I will tell you, I don't like Aptasia X. I don't like the Kelkwasser stuff. I don't the, either. The laser thing is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Uh, the, Dangerous too. Yeah. Because it can jump, because you got so many glass panels, it can direct to someone Wear else. Wear the glass. Don't do this. Don't buy the lasers. No. It's the dumbest thing you can do. They say you got to do it with glasses. No one else it, in the room. It's just dangerous. It doesn't work, man. Uh, it, not only is it dangerous, it doesn't work. Uh, then there's like people do like lemon juice, all this stuff. All those things to me, they kind of set it back, maybe kill out some of it, and it seems to spread to me when you do that. I don't know if it's true or not, uh, but like it does seem like when you decide to like go fight them, you're like gonna go heavy handed. All of a sudden, they just come out of everywhere. Yeah, I, I kind of believe that too. Okay, now have you one exception? Have you used Frank's F Aptasia? No, but I heard about it. Okay, you know what this thing does? 
it's kind of like the difference between like if you use that the the uh, like Kalkwasser stuff yeah, yeah, or yeah, the, the base. yeah if you that it kind of like kills it this frank septasia i think i don't really know what's in it but i think it's like a Kalkwasser paste mixed with something else and what it does is you kind of smear it over the hole and it doesn't have that instant reaction to it where like Kalkwasser will like shrink away yeah now you can kind of smear it over there and it forms like a crust kind of like when you do with the super glue yeah and the super glue will go in there and like seal it off and encase it and then it like comes out somewhere else yeah. this you kind of put this Kalkwasser stuff or presumably that's what yeah. it is this white stuff over it, and it forms a crust on the rock and seals it in but it also creates a toxic area in there where it's not going to come out somewhere else because it's going to kill it inside there and then after a couple of days you can come and blow it and the crust comes right off oh cool yeah uh it is uh i i would call it almost a miraculous tool it is a really really cool tool especially if you have tons of them now the reason i think it probably is kalkwasser is because if you use lots of it the ph definitely goes up so yeah. be, be careful yeah be careful <laughs> Uh, but a different solution to that. One we didn't talk about was uh, Nudibranx, the uh, the Bergia. Okay, so if you have tons and tons of them, they work. However, the rasses might try to eat them if you have rasses in your tank. Mm -hmm. If you have too much flow, they go around blowing. I have seen people have great success with them. Uh, the other problem that you have, they're not cheap and you nope. need a lot of them. Yep. And then once the aptation is gone, they're going to starve themselves. So... It's a great product if, if you know how to use it. But for me, I have never had success with I it. I think it's Salty Underground that uh, gave a bunch to us. And they absolutely work, right? No, they Again, do. If you're willing to buy a lot. And so this is one of those things. Like, it took you a year to build up this Aptasia problem. Uh, it's going to take you a year to get out of it. Yeah. Uh, it is not. You're not going to add these Nudibranx and tomorrow they're going to be gone. Uh, you're going to order from them. You're going to get a bunch of them. You're going to get little ones, big ones, medium ones. And they're going to slowly populate the tank. And then they'll slowly start to set them back. And then they'll slowly, one day, you'll walk up and say, oh, God damn it, I'm glad I did that. Yeah. Uh, you it's know, not overnight. Like, but it will be like, you know what, a year from now. Fighting all of these parasites is, is a full-time job. You have to outsmart them. You mm -hmm. have to use every, every weapon that you have possible. You know, you have to go at them. There's no other way. All right, another one here. The next one, number five, is planaria. For those who don't know, they are like a little brown flatworm that spreads like plagues and like coats everything. And if you look at it, it almost like in some cases looks like it might be like kind of a brown slime until you look closely and you're like, oh my, that is like a thousand flatworms. <laughs> yes, yeah, funny you say that. So this is one of the issues that has been coming around. So there's, there's all kinds of different flatworms. There's red flatworms, there's, there's brown ones, there's big ones, there's this. I'm sure there's all kinds. But this is a specific kind that has been going around in the past two or three years, I want to say. It goes in the euphilia. It goes in the mushrooms and montiporas. And yeah, that's basically it. I mean, basically, euphilia, mushrooms, and montipora. They love to hang out on those corals. And they reproduce and reproduce. And we've been having a tough time trying to figure out how to get rid of them. So one of the things that we came out was this blue velvet nudibranchs. Mm. They go ahead and eat them. So we had this one time where we we're having this issue and we kept putting the velvet nudies and we didn't see the population down until we realized that you have to blow the flyworm out of the Montipora, out of the mushroom, out of the euphilia. And then they go loose into the tank, they land on the sand, and then the velvet nudie brand will go eat it. Oh, really? Because they won't go on top of the coral. Oh, interesting. So it took us a while to figure out. So one of the other things that we noticed too was try to... Uh, drop the nitrate so they don't something about high nitrates is it helps them reproduce faster and then adding more flow to the tank it seems something about it on this uh planaria which planaria is a flatworm when you have low flow they seem to thrive better there's something mm -hmm. about it they just hate flow they like low flow areas now once you see one uh the like if you've never seen this problem then, then you probably don't know what we're talking about but once you've seen it in your tank and these things can just explode yes right uh, so I've, you know, it's funny after 20 years, I've never used this product, but what about Flat Salifert's Max? flatworm stop? Okay. Uh, flower Max, flatworm stop. They're great products. However, there's one issue with that. You have to remove as many as you can manually always, no matter what the case is, but flatworms, they, they're known for coming out, um, 
during the day when there's a lot of light. So the problem is... I think they're is, photosynthetic, partially. Yes, yes. Yeah. The problem is we seem to underestimate the number of fly ones that are in the aquarium. And when they die, they're toxic for the aquarium. And you can crash your tank. So for me, I've done it before. I try to do half of the dose. But I, I go very heavily dipping. Like, let's say if I know I have this, you feel, and it's got tons of them, I'm going to dip in, on, pro, uh, what's the name, pro, um, peroxide. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, yeah. Yeah, hydro peroxide. Uh, it seems to, like, the minute they touch it, the coral is on, it's fine. The coral doesn't even sense the medicine. But the flowers, it's instant. They just disintegrate right away. I saw this under a microscope, actually. Yes. We put one in there under the microscope and in a peroxide dip. And you can literally watch it dissolve, dissolve. Uh, uh, under there. Yeah, it's, it's so like, fast. It's like acid. It's just for them, it's horrible. And that time lapse thing, like right before your eyes dissolve. Yeah, you put it and they just come off. So what we what we done is we dip them on peroxide, and then you have to go with a hose and a turkey base to blow as many as you can, and suck as many as you can and run it through a filter suck. You got to do that for several weeks. Once you see the population is down, then you can do. Uh, salad for flatworm exit. They okay. work. Okay, so you have in here that uh, the peroxide dip is one to nine. So nine parts water, one part peroxide. Yes. Uh, all the way up to one to six. Okay. We did uh, an experiment here on peroxide, and like I want to repeat it because I want to be real responsible about this before we share this information. But like we were dipping, we went, we took zoanthids. Acan Lords, we took, uh, um, what is it? The Euphilia, we had the, like a torch, we had a frog spawn, we had, I don't know, we had a bunch, like six or seven different types of corals. And we dipped them in a variety of strengths of peroxide for two minutes, and almost all of them survived two minutes in straight hydrogen peroxide, which is basically like a freshwater dip filled with heavy oxidants, right? All of them did really well. I should say almost all of them. And when I say all of them though, we had multiple of each type of coral. Okay. And only in a couple inches, one of the types of, uh, not the entire, like if there was three types of, uh, of coral, only one of the three actually showed negative signs and even the strongest version of it. I got a feeling that we could use peroxide as a dip more aggressively than we do today. We just need to do a lot more testing on it because like this stuff is like a miracle. Yeah, I mean, those numbers there, that's what we've been using by, based on trial and error. So actually one of the other farms that I've talked to said they go through so much peroxide there that they bought a machine that will make hydrogen peroxide on site so that they oh, wow. don't have to keep buying all the jugs of it. Wow. <laughs> so that's interesting. So I'd never heard of the new, the blue uh, uh, velvet nudibranc and blowing them off and letting them eat them in the sand. That's the only diet. Yeah. Oh, really? That's the only diet for those blue velvet and ribbons. Oh, that's interesting. So that's all did, they. So did they die when the uh, planaria is finally gone? Yeah, I mean. Yep. Uh, that is. Uh, I mean, you see that with like a lot of different. Like that's one of the problems with the Bergia too. Is uh, <laughs> and they're expensive. Yeah, they're super expensive. But once the when you run out of Aptasia, like they go away. And what happens if they didn't find the very last one? And then the Aptasia comes back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's a problem. All right. The next one is uh, Zoa and Ghani spiders. All right. How do you deal with that? Um, See, there's a literal spiders that live on there. Yeah. So those are they're easier to spot. When you pay attention to your corals, you start realizing the more, the more you observe, the more you're gonna find. Mm -hmm. um, for these little guys, lots of rasses and interceptor treatment. So is Interceptor like the heartworm pill or? Yes, like it's back at it. So it, it, back in the days, it used to be called Interceptor. It's, um, I think it's for heartworm. For, for dogs. dogs. Yep. Heartworm, fleas, all that stuff. And they came out with this medicine in Reef Central 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it was first done for little red bugs. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about that. It's still yeah. there. So basically anything that has got a skeleton mm -hmm. is going to kill it. Interesting. Yeah. So that's what we do. We just do a bunch of rasses, interceptor treatment. If you want to do an interceptor treatment, we're going to get into red box next. But if you want to do it for Suanti spiders, if you want to do it for the Goni spiders, or if you want to do it for red box, uh, just type a uh, red box treatment interceptor on Google. And I'm sure it's going to take you, the formula is all over the place. It's the same formula. 
has been using for two decades. So zoanthids one, by the way, is one that tolerates full strength uh, uh, peroxide. So full strength, full strength. Yeah. And just like they can take the fresh water too, I guess. Yeah, uh, because like I, I first saw this uh, on YouTube, actually, somebody was doing their lords and their uh, zoanthids. And the primary purpose here was not for pests is because those things usually come with all kinds of weird funky algaes growing on there. Yes. OK, it was miraculous. You could take this frag, you could dip it in the uh, uh, peroxide for two minutes and then look at the frag tomorrow and it was like brand new. <laughs> like and there's no algae and those LPS type corals like that or, or softies in this case uh, are very likely to introduce funky algae and stuff to your tank. So it just strips him clean. Uh, yes. And so I can't help but wonder whether or not that would be an effective tool on the uh, spiders as well. Huh. We'll uh, have to try it. Do, so do spiders also, I mean, they must lay eggs. You know what? That's a good one. I, we don't see them often. It's not something comes. I've only seen him like once or twice. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And we don't see him often. I couldn't tell you last time I seen him, but it's something when you see him, you panic because they look like from like an alien. Like, it's scary looking. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a white little thing just walking over it. Just it's creepy. Yep. Okay. Next one is uh, little red bugs. Uh, what does this look like? If you look at your acropora, there's this tiny, tiny, the smallest little specks, and they're gold. That's the best way to see them. Um, this part I came around 20 years ago and a lot of people didn't know how to fight it. The only way to fight it is interceptor treatment. Um, one thing worth mentioning, we've been noticing when we dose an interceptor in the tank, we noticed that some of the mushrooms, they seem to stress out a little bit. They just shrink a little bit. We just noticed that recently and it's something just worth noting. I mean, uh, there's always a, a down, like... Every intervention has a downside, man. Yes. Like, there's no way around it. But sometimes the upside is greater than the downside. Yeah. yeah. So red bugs are a little easier to live with until you have a really, really bad infestation. Other than that, a lot of people don't even know they have them. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does, the colors are just not there. So go look at your aquaporas, pay attention, get close, get a little magnifying glass. If you see this little tiny golden dots, it's time for you to go to your vet. Tell him what your problem is. He'll be glad to uh, give you some interceptor. And then just follow, go to Google, look for the for the dose. Yeah, so uh, that's an important part here. You can't buy interceptor like do dog heartworm because uh, like they are real careful because like, you can kill your dog using yes. this stuff. So you have to use it very carefully. And that's why it's always like uh, prescribed by a vet. So most vets, if you explain to them what you're doing, most they'll, them, they'll yeah. just give it to you. It's 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 actually, yeah, they've, they've probably encountered this before. <laughs> yeah, if you show them the article and you explain to them what's going on, they just want to make sure that you're just, you're not just buying and thinking you know what you're doing, you're going to give it to your dog. And So the reason being is, if, I think it's because if your dog has flatworms or heartworms and you give it to them, just like the planaria kind of thing, if they die, it will kill the dog. Oh, they so, know that. So that's the purpose <clears throat> of it is to make sure your dog never gets them in the first place. Okay. Right? Gotcha. Uh, and so, like, same thing in our tanks is when you put that flatworm exit in there and then all of a sudden yeah. it you know, kills all the flatworms. Then what happened? Poison goes into the tank. Yeah, gotcha. Some similar, similar thing. Uh, all right. So go check out the interceptor. Sharp nose wrasses, chorus wrasses, uh, six line wrasses, that yeah. stuff. Uh, effective. I will tell you one uh, little story that I had. As a club member here at the TC Mass at Minneapolis Club, I went over to somebody's house for their, you know, meeting, and it was the coolest thing. Down in the basement, he had three super, super long tanks going all around all the whole basement, you know, and there was nothing else in the basement. This was just his for his okay. enjoyment and display. Uh, and then, you know, after his tanks just filled to the brim, and like somebody walked up and said, did you know you have little red bugs? I hate when okay. that happens. I never want to be the barrel bad news. Sorry. Okay, it broke the poor guy's heart, man. Because right, he's so proud. Of I've his been tanks, there man. before. The room's just filled with all of the local all club the members. All the is showing them and, and now the whole thing, anybody's talking about, is trying to find little red bugs in this tank, you know. Uh, and then, like, I've thought about that day since then because, well, I got news for you. That guy was able to build that tank so that it was end-to-end -end SPS. It was a beautiful, beautiful tank. He's probably had those bugs, man, for ages. Yeah, it no wasn't idea. brand new. He just didn't know what to look for. 
and you probably will need a little bit of a microscope or my, like with my eyes today, I'll definitely need a micro, uh, uh, magnifying glass. Yeah. Uh, but I'm once in the you same see, boat, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> once you see them, um, you'll know what you're looking for. It is this little teeny speck that kind of moves around. You know, yeah. it, it's just this little. You see them walking. If yep. you pay attention, you see them moving. little teeny, teeny specks on there and you'll start to see them. But the reality is, is I don't know if he ended up going to treat them or he just dealt with them going on from there. So it's been rare for me to see where the red box actually are hurting the core, where the core is like actually going backwards. It takes a very, very bad infestation. It seems like the core can deal with a low infestation, but if you see it like where it's loaded with them, that's the only time I've seen it where it's hard for them to kill a coral. It's uh, yeah, and can, so can you use, you can use, in this case, Interceptor right in the tank? Oh yes, yes. Yeah, I've never used it. However, if you use Intercept in your tank, it will kill all of your critters. All your hermit crabs, no, I'm mm. sure all your critters. All your shrimps, all your hermit crabs. Copepods and stuff probably too then? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, it wax them all, literally, so if you give you, you want your shrimp to live, your cleaner shrimp, your blood shrimps, whatever shrimps you got, you have to remove them manually before you do the treatment. Oh, interesting. I have seen where strong, like, cleaner shrimps, they make it through. Where you forgot, you didn't see that one was left behind, and they make it, but it's got to be a strong specimen. Wow. All right, next one here is uh, vermited snails. Everybody in the universe wants to know how to get rid of these things. Those uh, are very common. So you have to do a lot of manual removal. And what does it look like, by the way? It looks like this little, like, it's like this little um, 16 of an inch little thin stick coming out. Little tube. And, and you see like a little slime coming out here, like a little tube that it, sometimes it can poke your fingers. If you go grab a coral, it can puncture your finger. Mm -hmm. uh, they grow on the walls, they grow on the corals. They can be very annoying because when they grow next to a coral, they just release the slime and they start capturing food and that irritates the coral by being around. And a lot of people just live with them, but when you get too many of them, they become a problem. Bumblebee snails, they seem to eat them. And then what we do, we break them manually, and then you put peppermint shrimps in there, and then they go and eat them. Oh, so the peppermint, yeah. Okay, so. But well, you have happen, to break them. Yeah, what happens is, like, if you go in there, they're easy to break. You yeah. just break off all the tops, but it does not make them go away. Yes. I had never heard this part, though. So then after you break them, because they will come back, you add peppermint shrimp. They yeah, eat but the so have peppermints in there and just break them, and the peppermints they see open one, they go to town. Oh, that's so interesting. Yep, it's oh, just man. little things that we learn by experience. We don't read this anywhere, guys. It's based on experience with all the guys we have at the shop. And interesting, because okay, have you? Uh, so when I was doing reading about this, I read bumblebee snails, yes. and it's kind of hit or, or miss. Yeah, I'd never heard the peppermint shrimp uh, breakdown method. Gonna definitely try that. Uh, I've heard that uh, some you know, shrimp like uh, coral banded shrimp, they kind of have like little pinchers kind of designed for this. I've never shrimp. heard that, but I, I, um, I would like to try it, you know? Uh, then also some, I can't remember the names of the fish, but a handful of them. But the, the ones that come to mind for the, the challenge that I, I see with this is a lot of the times I won't see the uh, vermited snails win out on the surface. Like coralline algae will grab, beat it. Uh, maybe some animals beating it. Maybe even like copepods are catching them right before they're when they're tiny, you yeah. know, or whatever. I just don't see it a lot on the surface, but I see it a lot under, where like a lot of organisms don't live in the like, like the predators just don't seem to go after it. Because they're catching a lot of the, the unwanted foods. Yeah, underneath. They yeah. seem they seem to be like aptitious. If you feel if you feed a lot of particle foods, they seem to reproduce like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I imagine that for sure. Yeah, it can become a they, they grow in between acroporas, they grow out of corals, and then the corals try to grow. It's just, it's pretty bad, man. You can definitely see that actually that's true. I've seen it in some cases the worst where it's like you can see that acro's kinda like growing through it and around it, and then the acro gets this weird texture. Yeah, from all the and then bits. you try to break it, and they're embedded half the way through the core. It's pretty bad. Yeah, uh, vermited snails. All right, I'm definitely trying your your break them uh, yep. peppermint snail. Uh, for for what it's worth, people use peppermint uh, shrimps for this, I guess, and they also use it uh, for aptasia. Uh, my experience on them is uh, whatever amount you're going to put in there, like five x that. Uh, I, like for me, I you need to be aggressive. Add, adding four of them does not do the job. You need to have twenty. You need to be well, aggressive. Well, now that, now that you say, it, think about it. Like where I'm telling you, I have the hardest problem with these things is which uh, the undersides of it. 
that's exactly where those peppermint shrimp, shrimp live a lot, especially at night. Yeah. They come out and they do their little waving thing, yeah. crawling They're underneath. Yeah, because that's where upside, they find a lot of the stuff, yeah. Oh, that's pretty interesting. All right, so the next one, Euphelia flatworms. I've actually never even heard of this. What? Yeah. All right, so these are different. Earlier we were talking about brown planaria. These are flatworms. They don't go and eat the coal. They just hang out in the coal and irritate the crap oh, out of the Oh, are they those coal. big ones? Are these are long. Yeah, okay. These yeah, are long, yeah, yeah. and they go inside of the euphilia, huh. and they lay eggs around the base, and you can see the eggs as clear as day. Okay. Uh, the only way we found to get rid of them is just dipping on iodine. Okay. And just blow gently through the middle of the core, because if you blow too hard, you can hurt the tissue on the LPS. Mm-hmm. And just observe for the eggs. They're always on the base, right around the tissue. You see them on top of the tissue. Oh, really? Sometimes underneath, sometimes on top of it. It's, it comes mainly in torches and some hammers, but mainly some torches. Yeah. And it's ugly. When the thing comes from inside, it scares you because it's, it's a long flower. I mean, it looks like an alien. And you're like, what is this? Guys, every time I thought I seen every parasite in the hobby, wrong. When you get corals, you, you, you see all kinds of weird things come in. We have seen parasites. We don't even know what they are. So we had a, a tank here. So Jason had this beautiful, beautiful SPS tank, man. And it was, it was one of the best tanks we've ever seen here. And it got these weird little black bugs. Uh, and like nobody knows what they are or what they were. Well, we we yeah. could see them underneath the microscope, man. But tank wiped out. Nothing. There's nothing that we could do to yeah, stop it. Yeah, Interceptor wasn't able yep, to kill them. They tried that. Dude, nothing stopped these things. In like all of the nerdiest people here put every tool that they had to try to save it. And none of them, like black bugs. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was terrible. And that's why we call it top 10 parasites. These are the most common parasites that you will see on the home aquarium. And this is, I'd rather fight these parasites that I know what they are. And at least we have a way of fighting them. It's nothing worse than when you get a new parasite and you have no clue. You don't even know where to start. What does this look like? What's going to take care of it? Then you go do your research. Most of the time when a new parasite arrives, you start doing research. There's nothing online. Example, those black bugs that you mentioned, they start surfacing about five, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And people thought they were mythical. They didn't exist, you know? I mean, I haven't had many problems with them. But I have issues maybe six, seven years ago. And one time we caught them. And you're right, nothing could get rid of them. It seems so, like they're just there and just... Hey, even fish parasites. Uh, I, I'm going to butcher this, so don't quote me yeah, word no for word in this. But uh, uh, Elliot from Marine Collectors yes. uh, had some kind of t Tahitian bug. Uh, I, I think he called it Tahitian ick, but I'm, I may be butchering that. Uh, but it's a different one that was very medication resistant. Uh, and it probably wasn't ick. It was just some kind of Whatever, bug. Just something that... Super medication resistant. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they couldn't solve it, like to the point where don't want fish from there. Uh, scared, because uh, yeah. now once they're in the systems in the air and stuff, you can't, uh, it's very difficult to eradicate. Yeah. So like, just don't bring that, but like, what is it? Don't know, don't want to know, just keep away from me. Uh, next one here is Asterina stars. So uh, what do you do with those? So Asterina stars, oh, what, what do they simple. look like by the way? Little tiny little starfish. I have seen people selling them online before on eBay. It's disgusting that people are even doing that. <laughs> These things, they will eat suantes. They will munch on base of acroporas. They will munch on your coralline algae. They don't seem to be too bad, but they just reproduce very fast. They seem to be out first thing in the morning all over your glass. So my suggestion is very easy. Grab a hose, run it through your sump, run it through a filter suck, suck them every single morning, get the population down, add harlequin shrimp into your tank. That's harlequin shrimp. Uh, for those of you guys don't know, the only diet is live starfish. That's the only thing they like to eat. So they're going to get your population down. However, make sure that if you put a harlequin shrimp, you don't have a big ras in the tank because the ras will eat them for lunch. So the that's basically... They all eat each other. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people deal with these asterinas and it drives me crazy. I mean, you're going to have one or two here, but when I see an infestation and people are just letting them just be, anything you ever have in your tank, if you didn't introduce it, and it's just reproducing like crazy, get rid of it. I don't care how pretty it is. I don't care how bright it is. If you do not introduce it, it's reproducing fast. It's just a matter of time before it takes over your tank, and now you're not going to be able to control it. All right. I got really good news here. What you got? Is uh, This isn't the only one of this. We have a whole playlist of all the wisdom that's coming from Victor, and right. it's right here. <laughs> 